I don't know if any of you remember that book that appeared a few years ago by Jean-Benoît Nadeau and Julie Barlow. It was entitled 60 Million Frenchmen Can't Be Wrong, Why We Love France But Not the French. <laughs> it's, um, it's fairly lighthearted, but there's a lot of truth there. There are some great insights that for those of, of us who have particularly been immersed in France or in French culture, as, as I know many of you have, then you find yourself nodding with sudden insight. He, they comment in one chapter on the capacity the French have as a society for being divided over just about everything. That intrans intransigence is a deep centrifugal force that spreads throughout every corner of French society. My first trip to Paris, my first meal, I think, was spent in a group of priests who argued from the very beginning of the meal to the end on how the salad ought to be dressed. <laughs> or. So, and in traditional French thinking, they say, problems are then win-lose. There is this immediate power struggle in every dispute that demands a visceral response and allows no compromise. And they observe that there is, in fact, no French word for compromise. Who knew? Now, keep that in mind when you approach today's gospel. Jesus is presented with two seemingly inescapable options in this very familiar gospel scene. He must either identify himself as supporting this highly unpopular and deeply resented poll tax, and so risk alienating everybody, or as supporting civil disobedience and incur certain arrest for sedition. This is how these people and this society thinks. Life, politics, interpersonal relations, even religion are a struggle to the death between two opposing forces, one that admits of no compromise. But where others perceive conflict and threat, you or me, conquer or die, Jesus is working out of a completely different frame of reference. I think it's Richard Rohr, the contemporary Franciscan theologian, who, who asserts that you cannot grasp the Gospels until you step out of the mechanisms of dualism. That if you insist if you are locked into categories of them or us, into any categories that divide and oppose, then you cannot comprehend the preaching of Jesus. The first indication that Jesus has of being so aloof from this dynamic is he asks his questioners for a coin and so from the very start, he indicates that he carries no money himself. And then he carefully chooses his words. Our translation has Jesus asking, whose head is this and whose title? But the King James Version is actually closer to the original. Whose is this image and subscription? And so the Greek word being used is icon. And once we employ that word, then immediately we are taken to a, a, a much more profound level of discourse. At the very dawn of creation, God says, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness. Men and women are the icons of God. And so give to the emperor the icons of the emperor. Give to God the icons of God. Ah. 
And so when you try to imagine all of the dimensions of that assertion, this becomes not a clever way to avoid the question, but a, an introduction to a far more profound discussion. Give to God everything that bears God's image. Now this is a plea from Jesus' heart. He has set his face towards Jerusalem, has entered the city, now in such a way that when people asked who he was, others told them, he is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. And so this prophet has come to the holiest place imaginable, the city of the great king, the resting place of the ark, the site of the temple. And it is the place where Jesus knows that every other prophet who has entered this city has been stoned or burnt or impaled. This is the holy city, not because of its buildings and its artifacts. Holiness can never be held captive by architecture. This is the holy city because here people have witnessed with their blood and with their lives. Here God's response to this terrible history of destruction has been time and again to enter more deeply into the life of this city and this nation and more urgently with judgment and with forgiveness. Jerusalem with all of its bloody history is holy because God has visited this city time and again in all those who have entered it in God's name and now in the person of Jesus. Here will be seen God's definitive victory and God's definitive vulnerability. Having entered the city, Jesus, of course, as we've heard over the last three weeks, has told three parables, the parables all that deal with authority. And they are all given in response to the trap that he knows is closing in on him as this exchange about the temple tax is also a trap. The noose is now closing as Jerusalem prepares to do to him what it has done to all of those prophets before him. And it is in this environment that Jesus makes this final plea to people who are maneuvering to hand over to the power of Caesar that which belongs to God, one who is the very image of God. You see, in the first reading, Moses says, show us your glory. And God replies, you cannot look at my face and live. And so the, there is this profound, deep human longing to see the face of God. The psalmist picks this up. Show us your face, O God, and then we shall be saved. And outside the person of Jesus, we are always settling for icons. It's all we have, images and shadows of God among us. And Jesus says, give to God that which bears God's image. This is his own cry for life. This is an appeal to the powerful, to the pious, to imagine another perspective, to lift themselves out of this mentality of destroy or be destroyed, attack or be attacked, of clinging to this intransigence until the bitter end, of admitting no compromise no matter what it costs you. Instead, look for the image of God. You'll notice in that reading from Thessalonians, Paul writes, you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For in spite of persecution, you received the word with joy, inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that you have become an example to all the believers. Now this is probably the oldest Christian text we have. This predates the gospel, 
all of the Gospels. It predates all of Paul's other letters. And so in this first Christian text, Paul talks about the importance of what? Of being images of God, icons of God. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. But he also gives an insight into what that means. These people possess an authentic Jesus character. They are images insofar as, like Jesus, like Paul, like Silvanus and Timothy, they have received the word in suffering. It is this capacity to believe, to hold firm to our convictions, even while we are being persecuted, while we are ourselves in pain. This makes us true images. It's the great saint, you know, that we've, it's faded from the memory of the church, but Veronica, remember who, who wipes the face of Jesus and in, uh, and in mythology, she, she holds the, the cloth and, and it has the face of Jesus. That, that cloth is the sedarion, it's, it's preserved in, there are several of them around. They're, they're in, <laughs> but but the, 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 the devotion was here is the image, Veronica, Vero, icon, the true image. And so there is this longing in the church to know what Jesus looks like, to know what God looks like. And all we have is one another. And all we have is God present around us. It seems to me that this has such enormous implications for us as individuals, for us as members of a community, as citizens of the world. You and I are holy, not because we are triumphs of grace over guilt and, and chaos, not because we are flawless and perfect. You and I are holy insofar as our lives reveal the victory of God and of God's faithfulness in the very midst of all our disorder and all of our imperfections, that God's image is at least vaguely discernible in us and in our imperfect responses, our imperfect lives, our stumblings, our failings. Instead of engaging in kind with the forces of darkness, instead of reducing our life and every relationship to a fight to the death between two opposing intransigent forces, us and them, Instead, we strive to become images of God's presence and God's action in the world as we have seen it in the life of Jesus. And the church is holy. We are a holy people, not because we are a gathering of the good and well-behaved. The church is holy insofar as it is a triumph of grace, insofar as it brings together saints and sinners and strangers and somehow we come together and manage to trust one another, to bear with one another, to persevere with one another, and to join constantly in acts of repentance and in common praise. The 14th century German Meister Eckhart described God simultaneously being without name and being named by every name. I'll say that again. <laughs> being without name and being named by every name. Nothing tells us what God is, yet everything speaks to us of God. And so the specific thisness or thatness of all things becomes the one fertile source through which God is revealed everywhere, around us, in us. Because we can trace the outlines of God's image in ourselves, in one another, in the poorest and the most vulnerable, even in those we are assured are our enemies, then we have a reason to live with respect and with mindfulness and with compassion. And because we can recognize God's image in creation, 
we then are committed to preserving and protecting and enhancing this world that is entrusted to our stewardship. And so it seems to me that giving to God that which belongs to God is this vast, lifelong agenda that demands first having eyes to recognize God's image in all that God has created, in every face, in every nation, in all of creation, but beginning in that most unlikely of places, our own being. 